Once upon a time there was a girl whose dreams were sky high and whose resolve was solid as steel. Her name was Zaha. When Zaha was young, her country was in a boom time. She lived in the biggest city in Iraq, Baghdad. In the 1950s, Baghdad was awash in oil money, so the government commissioned all the biggest names in architecture to come to this ancient city and fill it with modern-style buildings. A new university campus, a sports complex, a U.S. embassy. These modern designs swirled all around her, but in her house, she was the designer. Zaha's mother was an artist, and early on she saw that her daughter had a flair for light and shape and color. She would let Zaha design rooms in their home in Baghdad. By the time she was 11, she was already designing clothes and even furniture. Maybe, just maybe what Zaha's mother knew was that this encouragement was just what her daughter needed to become what she would become, an artist, a teacher, a builder, and the queen of the curve. I'm Neri Oxman, and this is Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls, a fairy tale podcast about the rebel women who inspire us. On this episode, Zaha Hadid. Zaha was born in 1950. Her father was a wealthy business executive and a politician. Her mother, as we've said, was an artist who taught Zaha to draw with precision and with imagination. Zaha was full of curiosity and independence. Her brother used to say that she could be the first Iraqi astronaut. Buildings and design entered Zaha's life early. Baghdad, even now, is a blend of streamlined modern buildings next to ornate Islamic architecture. Their archways, colorful geometric patterns, and columns can make even a bank or an office building feel like a palace. Zaha's hometown was a mix of the past and the present bustling streets full of honking cars and people shopping, right next to buildings that were hundreds of years old. Zaha traveled a lot with her family growing up. They traveled through Europe, and everywhere they went, her father made sure that they saw all the most important buildings and museums. For Zaha, it was a feast for her eyes and her mind. She also traveled with her father to see the Sumerian ruins in southern Iraq. These ruins are a reminder of an advanced ancient civilization from around 6,000 years ago. The Sumerians are responsible for the earliest form of written language, for math, and even for the concept of time. Their architecture was very sophisticated, with arches and domes and vaults, But the Sumerians didn't just build dwellings. They built the first fully planned out cities with markets and other places for people to do business, with public squares where people could meet and talk. Standing there, Zaha could imagine these ancient people going about their daily lives. The rivers and the dunes of the Middle East would later inspire her greatest creations. It was on those trips that Zaha fell in love with buildings and how they're made. And her brother's dreams for her to become an astronaut came back down to earth. When she was 11, on top of interior designer, furniture designer, and clothes designer, Zaha Hadid said she wanted to be an architect. Architecture is an amazing, challenging job. Think of your favorite building, maybe one you've seen in photos or even in your own home. Architects design them 
so they can be built in real life. Every building from the Eiffel Tower to the Golden Gate Bridge was designed by an architect. And though she didn't know it at 11 years old, Zahadid would change the field of architecture forever. When she was 17 years old, Zaha headed to the American University in Beirut, Lebanon. There she studied mathematics. Zaha's mind was always problem-solving. When she found a snag in something, she pushed and pushed and pushed until she fixed it. But math was just a stepping stone. In 1972, she moved to England and studied in a world-renowned architecture school in London. There, she learned from experts in the field. Her teachers were thrilled by her abilities. One of them said she had spectacular vision. Even then, her talents were undeniable. In her final year at school, she had the opportunity to design a hotel that would tower above London's Thames River. So many architects might have designed ornate castles or stately buildings to match Buckingham Palace, where the Queen lives just down the road, but not Zaha. Instead, her building looked nothing like anything that existed in London at that time. Instead of winding towers and round golden balconies, her design was angular and sharp. It looked like the future. When one famous architect saw it, they said Zahadid was like a planet in her own orbit. Where the rest of the world saw rules, Zaha saw opportunities to break them. Buildings are full of limits. How tall they have to be. How many floors they need to have. But she also saw all the ways they could be experimented on and made entirely new. Of course, it takes a long time for buildings to get made. Almost as long as it takes for new ideas to be accepted. For a long time, Zaha worked mostly on paper, drawing sketches and blueprints of her dreams for new kinds of buildings. Her designs were revolutions in the world of architecture, and people called her the Queen of the Curve. Lots of people loved her work, and she won big awards. But at the end of the day, they found her buildings too radical to actually make in real life. People didn't want her futuristic structures interrupting their skylines. It seemed like her dreams would be doomed to only live in her notebooks. But Zaha kept drawing anyway. Then, In 1989, an interesting project came to her. She had the chance to design a fire station in Germany. Now, you might have seen a fire station before. They mostly don't look too different from each other. There is a big garage door for the truck to get in and out of, a huge space for the firefighters to work, and of course, a pole. Instead, Zaha created a fantastical building made up of striking sharp lines. It looked a little like a paper airplane. It was made of teetering shapes, set at angles that seemed impossible to achieve. But this one got built. Zaha once said, I believe in the idea of the future. And here, here it was. A fire station in a small town in Germany. After that, more and more people began to notice Zaha Hadid's work. But she was not just one of a kind thinker in architecture. She was usually the only woman in the room. 
and sometimes on the whole project. People dismissed her ideas just because of her gender. They ignored the fabulousness of her designs, how groundbreaking they were. But this made her push even harder. And then, as more people learned about Zaha Hadid, they wanted to learn from her. She taught students across the world and helped teach a new generation of women architects how to advocate for themselves. But she never saw herself as someone training people to be architects. She would say, I don't think you can teach architecture. You can only inspire people. Zaha was always exploring what a building could be and do. She wanted to challenge those ideas too. So she experimented with form and waves. She said a building should be able to excite you, to calm you, to make you think. And around the early 2000s, her design started to focus on those questions. Instead of just thinking about the ways it could look different, she was curious about how they could feel different. Zaha realized that architecture has the power to make people more friendly. Think about it. You could design paths between buildings and rooms that are straight and simple. But instead, Zaha planned out walkways through different greenery and spaces, inviting you to bump into new people and maybe learn something along the way. Architecture to Zaha was an opportunity to encourage adventure, even if that adventure just took you from one part of your office to another. She wanted her designs to invite those little chances to make a new friend or spark a chat. She also wanted to make it easy to get in so anyone on the street can feel like they have a place in her buildings. When she built the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, she didn't just design the building. She also designed the sidewalk outside and had it lead right into the museum. Someone walking along the path could be lost in thought and end up inside without realizing it. Zaha called this experiment an urban carpet, as if you're walking the red carpet on your way into a big glitzy event. In 2004, all of Zaha's brilliant buildings and new ideas led to a major recognition. She was awarded the Pritzker Prize. For architects, this is the highest honor anyone can win. She was the first woman and first Muslim to ever receive the award. I still believe in the impossible, Zaha said when she won. In the years after, the queen of the curve showed us what impossible looks like. She designed the famous London Aquatic Center with a wavy roof that looked like water itself. And the Guangzhou Opera House with thousands of tiny interior lights that make you think of a starry night. And Beijing's Galaxy Soho, a giant entertainment megastructure made up of four separate buildings held together by pedestrian bridges. They're all a sign of what happens when someone dreams beyond what we believe can be real. Generations from now, people may look at Zaha Hadid's work and see it as old-fashioned, but that is hard to imagine. Her buildings are timeless and forward-looking, a celebration of ancient form and a brave attempt to construct the future. One where someone might bump into a new friend take a different path and wander into a spectacular new space. That is the Za Hadid dream. This podcast is a production of Rebel Girls and is based on the book series Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. This episode was produced by Isaac Kaplan Walder sound design and mixing by Camille Stennis and Steve Pogatch. This episode was written by Anusta Bramanian and proofread by Ariana Rosas. 
executive producer is Katie Spreger. A big thanks to the whole Rebel Girl team who made this show possible. Original theme music was composed and performed by Electra Barjaki. For more, visit rebelgirls.com. Until next time, stay rebel.